Welcome to Sudden Science. Thank you very much for coming for the last talk of the season. You know, um, they say you make the best friends of your life right here at okay. Sudden Science. <laughs> what they say, it's what someone wrote on the comments on one of our YouTube videos. These talks are recorded. If you ever want to relive this moment, uh, it will be recorded on the internet in infamy. And you can go to our website to relive these talks. But have you ever felt out of place or somewhere in life like you didn't belong? Absolutely, right? That's part of the human experience is being an outsider at some point in our lives. Some of you are probably thinking that right now. If this is your first Suds and Science talk, you may be thinking, oh man, is he going to call on me? Is there a pop quiz on giraffes or something? <laughs> there isn't any of that. But I do remember, <laughs> oh, there, there, there might be, right? So um, I can think of a couple times in life where I felt really out of place and like I didn't belong. And one of those was my wife 10 years ago, who was my girlfriend at the time. We were traveling in Peru. We were in the, on the spine of the Andes, 15,000 feet, in a little village called Junín, where my wife is a fluent Spanish speaker. Uh, we couldn't use the Spanish because nobody spoke Spanish in this village. It's uh, Quechua people, it speaks Quechua language. Yeah, yeah, 15,000 feet up in the Junín province. And every door, I'm not a tall man, I'm 5'9". And every door that I would walk into, I would stoop to get in because most of the local people are just under five feet tall. So a five foot nine or giant like myself, every place to get into. And I slept in someone's home for the night while I was up there looking for birds, of course. Um, I slept with my neck crooked to the side and my feet curled up to fit into this smaller bed. I definitely did not belong there. That place was not built for me. Same trip, traveling down into the Peruvian Amazon. There are no buses down into the western side of the Amazon. Um, Pile yourself in with four other adults in the back of a pickup truck. 30 adults clinging in the bed of the pickup truck to basically cages to hold themselves on. Like 40 people in a pickup truck going down these mud-filled roads into the Amazon. And after you get into the truck, we paid more to sit in the back of the truck with four other adults. And as we were crammed in the back, um, just literally like this, for a six hour trip down into the Amazon, these mud roads. Um, after you get in, they put chicken crates on the side of the trucks to effectively lock you in, but it's of course so they can transport the chicken. There's no opening the doors at that point. You are in the vehicle until someone takes the chicken cages off the side of the truck. We came to a series of rivers to cross and each one as we moved down in elevation came larger and larger and our 14-year-old driver, more or less, <laughs> also, um, had no hesitation about passing 50 or 60 trucks that were parked on the road before the last river crossing. Too afraid to cross, but not our, not our season 14-year-old driver. <laughs> we came to the edge of this river, he stopped, and it was something I would never, ever consider even taking my whitewater kayak across, um, logs going down, and He's got this truck, he jumps out, takes a section of garden hose, puts it on something in the engine, snakes it out the side of the hood, under the wiper blade, holds the snorkel to mm -hmm. the windshield. I remember taking out my camera and I put it away quickly because I was too afraid to keep filming. I, I had to hold on to myself. I remember we went into the river and water came up over the front of the truck. And this is a jacked up truck where the, you have to be helped up into the vehicle and water comes over the hood and splashes up onto the windshield. And I wa watched as my feet began to be surrounded by water that was filling the truck bed, uh, truck cab from below. And the other people in the truck had warned me to pick up my backpack and put it on my lap because the water came up almost to my knees in this jacked up truck. And it was only because there are 40 people holding this truck down that we bounced around and made it across this river. And how about the chickens? But the chickens got wet. <laughs> What about me? <laughs> I, I made it. No, that's a, you figured that already. But I realized that moment I definitely did not belong there in that time. But if you have not been to Suds and Science before, anyone care to admit this is their first Suds and Science experience? Well, welcome. Terrific. And Michael, thank you. That's, that's great. And welcome very much. So my name is Jason Hill, and I'm a quantitative ecologist at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, and we are a local nonprofit. We are a bunch of researchers who put our computational and brain power to use to help um, develop um, improved management and conservation of imperiled species throughout North America and South America. We work across the Western Hemisphere. And where? And Africa. Thank you, Dean. Yeah, in Africa, yeah. And um, if you don't know us, you should. 
and we are a local nonprofit. We are just down the road. I organize Seds and Science as a community service, essentially, as an opportunity for you to engage and interact with um, experts in their fields, to be interactive with them, to not just hear them talk, but to engage with them and to ask them questions. And I know Michael would be very pleased if you would treat this not as a lecture, but as a conversation and an opportunity for you to ask questions to an expert um, in a very casual setting. Imagine this is your, your, your living room and you're sitting here. So with that, I will just say a couple things. As some of you know, at times, Suds and Science attendance this year has been, uh, it's been, this room has been crowded. At times, we've certainly pushed the fire capacity for this room, pushing 100 people in here. And so we've had to actually turn people away from this room, filled up that room, and people have left. There is, as some of you know who come here regularly, there's been a, I've been exploring other venues for Suds and Science um, over for the next year. This is really manageable, and this is terrific. And, I'm, and this is the last Suds and, Suds and Science talk of the season until next November. This is terrific. I'm, I'm going to pass around a sheet. I've asked many people individually um, and got feedback from a lot of Suds and Science regulars, which most of you are. I recognize so many common faces. Thank you for supporting me and supporting Suds and Science. Um, I'm going to pass the sheet around. I'm going to pass two around each direction. And there's a simple poll here on the front. And you just put a tally mark, just a vertical line. Whether you would like to see Suds and Science remain here at the Norwich Inn, which is a comfortable, familiar, living room type space with a bar. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah. And um, it's convenient. Um, on the other hand, on some nights when there are 80 or 100 people trying to crowd in here, it's, it's unbearable. We've had people sitting on the floor, 15 people before. Um, I get a lot of email complaints asked to, from people say, like, I came two hours away and I couldn't physically get into the room. That's really frustrating for me. Um, I understand that, but I'm really, happy, I'm really pleased that the Norwich Inn has hosted us for as long as they have. There's a simple pull on the front. It just, if, just put, your, get, put your feeling down whether you would like to stay at the Norwich Inn or another opportunity is the Montshire um, has welcomed to host us. Uh, Marcos and I have been um, talking about some opportunities. Basically, we'd be in the large common room there. It could hold 150 people. It would mean me setting up all 150 chairs every night. Keep that in mind. <laughs> uh, they'd give me a key I'm to the sure closet. I'm sure you have lots yeah. of volunteers. Yeah. Can we, help you. we would try to get the inn to bring beer and to serve beer for half an hour. They weren't frustrated at me for leaving. Um, it's a giant common space room. It'd be rows of chairs. The um, sporting arena type seating. It would not have an intimate feel that this has, but it would hold more people. And it's easily parking. Maybe some. Maybe there are some components of that you might prefer. What town is that? In? That's just right across the. It's just um, 700 meters, uh, 100, 1,250 meters that way. <laughs> yeah, that's my best guess. Um, it's right up before the bridge into Hanover. Um, and it would be essentially our museum for the evening. We would not be in the museum exhibits. They, they won't allow that. We'd be in a dedicated room. It's like an indoor basketball arena, basically. And you have the best of both worlds. Yeah. Can you on, on, on attendance? The lieutenants is it, low. I know, Michael. It's, here. It's, a there. It's, it's so hard to predict attendance. Um, to, to, to attendance is vary between 60 and 100 people. I really don't want to ask people to tell me in advance they're coming. Um, I don't want to be the gatekeeper. Um, this is something I put on in my own time, essentially, and I already have plenty on my plate, let alone keeping track of 60 people and RSVPs. Um, I'm just throw out another idea. Yeah. King Arthur. Yeah, King Arthur, we have, I've definitely thought about um, as a venue. That's a good idea, actually. Um, I'll put that on here. So the Montshire versus here staying in Norwich. Just vote. I'll just honor system, obviously, each person just vote once. If you don't know much about us, you'll find on the back of these clipboards there are some examples of the field notes that we produce twice a year. And there's an opportunity to sign up if you want. Put your email address down to receive our monthly e-news. It's a bunch of computational, biological nerds like me who study bees and butterflies, keeping you informed of the scientific literature and of our own research so you don't have to. It's a pretty good deal. And it's entirely free. We obviously don't share your information with anyone else um, if you want, so I'll pass those around. Any questions on that? What's the been the average attendance? It's about 70 people. And yeah. 
So now, we want to load it. What do we have here? Roughly? As we get closer to the summer, attendance really drops off. Imagine if Suds and Science had been last night. I'm not sure I would have come. Uh, I would have come for Michael, but I, I, otherwise, I was in my garden last night at, up until 10 o'clock at night. Okay. 70 people in general. 70 yeah. people, so generally, attendance is every seat in this room is filled. There are 15 people standing in the doorway, and there are 15, 20 people in that room block, and blocking the wine cabinet as well. That's average attendance. So, um, so I will pass these around. Feel free to vote, and if you want to sign up for e news or feel free to do so. Um, having said that, thank you very much for being here for this entire season, last talk of the series until next November. Um, and I hope you'll stay with us. You can always go to our website, Vermont Center for Eco Studies, and search for Suds and Science and see videos. Uh, thank you, Kaylee and CATV for videotaping, uh, for being our videographer and providing really high quality video and audio of these talks that you can watch online over and over every Friday night. For example, you could do that. You would. I wouldn't. Rec you could do that. You could. Do that. Yeah. So if we were at the Munch, I okay, know. Yeah. I see you. You don't, keep, yeah. you don't like people to um, show the slides or things like that, but we could, right? Right. We're with the Munch. Suds and Science is a PowerPoint-free series. Uh, and, um, but sometimes I, I think it's I know. a little, you know, Pretty video, video wow. visual it, thing would yeah. be kind of nice. It's so hard once I open the floodgates. Right. Right. So many of the, especially Get professors, closer, yeah. former academics like myself, start doing this. Yes. And they start talking to the slides, yes. and you're just, yes. you're just an afterthought. You're, they're not there for you. They're there for the PowerPoint they've given 100 times. Mm -hmm. And I would probably be the just same. A you know? Just a thought. I know. I, I could give them like a limit of two slides. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, I could see, you'll see Michael has a bunch of handouts and things, uh, things for you to look at. I love that approach. You know, it's, it's organic. It's here. It's not some computer-generated screen behind me. So I'd like to keep it that way. I know the Montreal would allow us to do that, but I think I would forbid it. <laughs> so I will pass these around. Thank you again for supporting Suds and Science and Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Um, as always, I'm your host, Jason Hill, and I'll be here afterwards if you want to ask me any questions. If you're not sure, you don't have to vote, of course. Um, tonight's speaker, I think we're in for a real treat. We have someone who is going to regale us of their, their research and time spent in Africa studying giraffe populations, another species that has had a hard time fitting through doorways and fitting in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's soon to be Dr. Michael Brown. So this 1,400 pound giraffe is drunkenly stumbling across the Ugandan savanna. She's feeling a little woozy because she's T plus six minutes into a heavy dose of a torphine hydrochloride, which is an opiate a couple thousand times more potent than morphine. It's a drug, indeed, that can kill a human being in, in a couple minutes. And I know this because as we're driving up to the giraffe to dart her, the Ugandan Wildlife Authority vet next to me is instructing me on how to administer the antidote to him in the event that he accidentally pricks himself with the dart as he loads the drug into his gun in the bumpy Land Cruiser. <laughs> it's, da it's daunting, yeah. These are the uh, occupational hazards that they don't prepare you for in academia. <laughs> but you roll with it because you have to. Now it's the end of the dry season and three months of intense sun and wildfire have raised the grass, which is usually about three feet high. And now the recent rains have brought it up to about an inch, making it easy for the Ugandan Wildlife Authority rangers who are chasing this drunken giraffe on foot to see the aardvark holes and termite mounds that are all around. As they run up to her, rope in hands, like this one, in fact, this one has been used. We have four Ugandan Wildlife Authority rangers on one side, four Ugandan Wildlife Authority rangers on the other side. And as the animal, slowed by the tranquilizer, walks across the savanna, they run up around her. And if any of you guys have seen Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back, like an Imperial AT-AT walker on the ice planet Hoth, they bring her down by wrapping up her legs, and she tumbles. As she falls, they jump on top of her, pinning her down so she can't get up. And quickly, the vet comes in to administer the reversal. 
because if she has this drug in her for too long, she'll overdose much like you or I would on this opiate. Um, so as the rangers are down, holding her down, she's fully conscious, moving. This 1,400-pound giraffe trying to get up. But they're holding her down. And the reason they're holding her down, if you look at her back rear leg, she's carrying a wire cable wrapped around it. Yeah, very often in this particular system, poachers lay hundreds of snares. Um, and now draft probably aren't the target for this. Antelope are much easier. These smaller cob or, or hard beast are probably a lot easier to butcher in the field. Uh, but snares are indiscriminate. And giraffe often get caught up in them as well. But giraffe are big and giraffe are strong. And where a cob might not be able to free itself from these snares, giraffe are often able to rip these snares off from the trees. In fact, I've seen giraffe dragging whole trees with snares attached to them uh, behind them. And so they'll carry these snares with them. Uh, oftentimes they'll cut in deep uh, and they'll get infected. And that's what these, these, po these uh, rangers and these veterinarians are working with on this giraffe. It's very stressful for the animal. It's very stressful for them. Uh, but indeed, it's necessary. So as they hold it down, uh, one ranger comes in with a makeshift iron hook and the other comes in with some really hefty wire cutters, and they go to work on this cable. It's been in for a while, and you can tell that because the tissue around the wound uh, is infected, it's necrotic, and you can smell it even before you can see it. Uh, but all hope is not lost. The vet comes in, uh, they treat it, they've got this, uh, this blue antiseptic spray, they inject her with a heavy dose of antibiotic, they cut the snare off, and they gently, slowly, all get off of the giraffe. She rocks up, a little intoxicated still from the atorphine, but she makes her way woozily back to her herd. This is but one of the many challenges that giraffe in Uganda and indeed across Africa face. Uh, and hopefully over the next couple minutes, uh, we'll be discussing uh, what we do, uh, what I do, what I and my partners, um, both at Dartmouth and uh, overseas do to help understand these ecosystems uh, and design conservation strategies based on our understanding. So I'm Michael Butler-Brown, uh, PhD candidate uh, just across the river at Dartmouth College in the uh, graduate program in ecology, evolution, ecosystems, and society within the biological uh, uh, studies department. Uh, so I'm only a couple minutes into this presentation and I already have uh, a bit of a confession. Uh, although gratuitous stories of giraffe wrangling are often a good way to hook an audience, <laughs> realistically they represent a very, 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 very small portion of what I actually do uh, in the field. Uh, now you guys seem like a pretty sophisticated crowd. Uh, a highbrow group of pub goers, so if you'll indulge me. <laughs> I instead, rather than focusing on catching charismatic megafauna, uh, which I can do if that's what you guys prefer, um, but I prefer instead to focus on the nuance and uh, poetry of the ecological studies that we conduct over there uh, and, and, and how we use our understandings of these ecosystems to design effective conservation strategy. Uh, now, as mentioned earlier, um, I've got a lecture, and, and to be quite honest, I'm a little nervous in that I've never actually given a talk without that crutch of, of PowerPoint. <laughs> giraffe are really easy in that they often sell themselves, so if you put pictures of giraffe up there, yeah. uh, you, can, you can get away with anything, and I don't have that right now. Um, so, if this can be more of a conversation, like you said, and rather, rather than a lecture, I would much rather prefer if you guys have anecdotes, uh, questions, just shout them out along the way. Uh, some of y'all have beers in hand, hopefully it'll be a little, little bit easier as the night goes along. Um, but really, please um, interrupt when you feel free. I want this to be a conversation. Um, so uh, broadly speaking, I identify as a conservation ecologist. Uh, now ecology takes all sorts of flavors. We got a couple of ecologists in the room. Uh, in the back there, you're an ecologist. Uh, what is it that you study as an ecologist? How do you, how do you identify? Uh, I self-identify as a quantitative ecologist. Uh -huh. I spend most of my time writing computer code. Yeah. To do what? To investigate the forces that uh, drive populations up and down. Cool. Any other ecologists in the room? 
Are you an ecologist? I heard rumors you were. <laughs> Probably call me one. All right. <laughs> I consider myself more of a conservation biologist. Um, so I try to understand, uh, I'm an ornithologist really, and understand uh, the issues in the natural history and, and, and annual cycles of, of, of birds that require our attention with their conservation, basically. Cool. Yeah, so ecology takes on lots of uh, different flavors. Um, there's some people in, in my department alone who'll study like uh, I insect population dynamics that could affect forestry management decisions. There's other people that look at like uh, bacterial systems and in, in roots of trees that affect uh, um, um, uh, nutrient cycling in forests. Um, but the flavor of ecology that I focus in uh, is largely uh, foraging ecology upscale. So what interests me um, historically is large animals on large landscapes. So since I was like a little kid uh, chasing white-tailed deer around the woodlands of Pennsylvania, I've always been interested in how these big animals uh, utilize these incredible landscapes they live in, um, especially when these landscapes vary in quality over space and time. So big animals like a white-tailed deer, like a giraffe, like an elephant, like a pronghorn, a bison, um, they, they need certain resources to exist, to reproduce, uh, but these resources for them vary in space and time. So here in, in, in Vermont, I mean, we've got some pretty intense winters, and I know down in Pennsylvania that always confused the bejeepers out of me. How do animals like deer uh, exist in these incredibly seasonally and varying environments uh, where, you know, now and then into summer, there's in, an incredible richness of resources for them, but when you get into winter, it's pretty barren out there. It's pretty rough to make a living. Uh, even, you know, when you want to go out and pick up the newspaper in the morning, it's, it's rough for you guys. You can imagine trying to eke a living out of the system where there's, there's no leaves on trees. Um, and so in these environments where, sea, or where resources vary in quality and quantity over space and time, how do big animals, especially ones that can move around the landscape, how do they achieve uh, uh, the resources that they need to thrive? Uh, and, and so that's what I look at largely as, uh, as a conservation ecologist. Uh, now your views on ecology uh, can largely be influenced by, by your personal philosophies. And so um, I want to perhaps offer a few metaphors from my own personal perspectives on ecology and how I view the science of ecology. Um, so I'll offer two, uh, maybe one a little more abstract and a little more concrete. Um, so we can view the systems that we live in as like this, this beautiful and chaotic jazz song, right? We've got this, this awesome saxophone player over here, this really skillful pianist over here, uh, and this, this goofy clarinet guy, but for some reason he's, he's off in the corner doing his thing. And they're all kind of playing this music, and they're all kind of doing their own thing, uh, but it fits together and it makes a sound that's pretty harmonious. Uh, and, and in, a, in a, a system like a jazz song, there's, there's this rhythm, right? That's unifying it. There's this beat, this percussive rhythm that's driving this song. And as an ecologist, that's what I'm trying to do. Block out the saxophonist and that goofy clarinet player and focus on the rhythm that are driving some of these interactions. Now, we can view this as another metaphor, uh, perhaps a little less abstract and maybe a bit more uh, industrial. We can view ecosystems as this incredibly complicated uh, machine with thousands of cogs interlinked with each other. So we can look at uh, like an East African savanna, for instance, and we've got thousands of cogs. Up here, we've got an elephant cog, and then we've got a lion cog. Here's some termite cogs, an acacia cog, a hornbill cog. And all these cogs are connected to other cogs uh, so that I can't spin my, what did I say was up here, hornbill? My hornbill cog without ultimately spinning my elephant cog. And so I'm trying to get an understanding of this incredibly beautiful and complicated machine in this particular instance by focusing on the giraffe cog and all of the other cogs that it connects to. So it's a very limited scope, uh, but by trying to understand what's going on here, uh, it tells us something maybe a bit more 
about this incredibly beautiful and complicated machinery uh, that is this ecosystem. Now I've got the added goal of trying to apply my understanding of this cog uh, to conserving it. So I identify again as a conservation ecologist to trying to take my understanding of this beautiful system uh, to protecting what I consider beautiful within it. Um, and so that's ultimately my goal. And so hopefully, um, over the next couple of minutes, I'll convince you uh, that learning some things about giraffes and the interactions that they have within this system uh, can help us to design effective conservation strategy to make sure that these incredibly beautiful and iconic animals uh, can persist on this landscape. Um, so uh, before we get into what I actually do in my studies, I think it's maybe important to introduce the players in it. Uh, and uh, this is a, a talk largely on giraffe, and I reckon that's kind of what brought a lot of people into this room. Uh, I, I have, I mean, there are no illusions that I'm more interesting than giraffe. <laughs> um, and indeed, if I studied something like shrews or mouse, I don't think there might be nearly as many people in this room. Uh, so let's focus a little bit on the giraffe. Um, how many of y'all in this room have been to Africa? So we, we, got, we got a few. Cool. How many of y'all have seen giraffes over there? Where have you guys seen them? Tanzania, Kenya. All over. Yeah. Uganda. Uganda? Yeah. Uganda. Uganda? Where in Uganda? Thurston Falls, Kudaloo National Park. You saw them in Queen? Yeah. Oh. Huh. Anywhere? No, no. None now. Yeah. Anyone else? I know you guys have seen them down in southern Africa, yeah? And Rwanda. Yeah. And Akagera, yeah. And what's the first thing you notice when you see giraffe? They're big. They're massive, yeah? <laughs> They're massive animals. Uh, and, 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 and more conspicuously, perhaps, they've got these incredible necks. There is no mistaking a giraffe for anything out there. And it's largely because of their necks. Uh, and, and, and giraffe necks in and of themselves are in, incredibly fascinating, fascinating components of their natural history. Uh, so, so why do, why do giraffes, well, let's zoom back a little bit. Giraffe, giraffe necks are comprised, interestingly, of the same number of cer cervical vertebrae. Seven. Seven, yeah, as, as you or I have, right, which is incredible. That, there's, only very only, there's only a few mammals that have a uh, different number than seven. Does anyone want to take a guess as to what they actually are? It's a bit of an aside. There's, a, there's only one mammal that, that I know of that has more than seven cervical vertebrae, and it's a weird one. Three-toed sloth. <laughs> yeah, two-toed sloths have five to seven, three-toed sloths seven to nine, and manatees have a bit fewer. But like, universally, seven, seven cervical vertebrae is, I don't know why that is, it's kind of a bizarre, um, but it's a neat little bit of uh, trivia to keep for another pub night, perhaps. <laughs> um, but seven cervical vertebrae, um, but they're just much more elongated uh, to create these, these incredible necks. And, and why do they have necks like that? Food. food. Yeah, yeah, food's one of them, right? That's, that's, that's a hypothesis for why giraffes have long neck. Obviously, if you're feeding up at 15 to 19 feet, there's not much else up there. Maybe some elephants can get up there with their long trunks reaching up. Sometimes elephants will even stand on their hind feet and grab their... Oh yeah, or knock the tree down more likely, yeah. Elephants do that quite often. Uh, but another competing hypothesis for the giraffe neck is what we call the necks for sex hypothesis. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So it, even if you look at the evolutionary history of giraffes, uh, going back into the fossil record, prehistoric giraffes, most of them don't really have long necks. Yeah, so, so if you look at some extinct giraffe, there's an incredible one called um, Shivatherium. It looked like a big moose, and it had actually these palmated moose-like ossicones. Um, uh, but even, even some of the other extinct giraffes, they didn't have that long neck. So the, the long neck is a relatively recent development for giraffes. Uh, and, and some people suggest it's not just for food, uh, but it's also for fighting. Uh, so one of the things, if you look at giraffes, males and females next to each other, they've got this incredible sexual dimorphism, right? Males are just so much bigger than females. They're just so much more massive uh, and so much taller. Males can be like up to 19 feet in height and just, just bulkier. So the biggest, oldest bulls are just massive. Uh, and, and one of the interesting components of the size difference is the development of bones in their skulls. 
So giraffe are very interesting in that the, the members of the giraffid family, of which there are only really two extant clades, we've got giraffes and uh, okapis. You guys know what okapis are? Mm -hmm. There's these, uh, these sm sm small, relatively speaking, seven feet tall giraffids that run around the rainforest in like the Democratic Republic of Congo. Stripes on, Stripes on the legs. They kind of look like zebras in the back there. Beautiful animals, extraordinarily elusive. They don't have long necks. Uh, it's hard to run around the rainforest with, with long necks like that. Uh, but giraffes and okapis have these, um, they're not horns, they're not antlers. They're distinct to giraffids. They're called ossicones. Uh, and what they are is just a, a, a continuation of the bone. Uh, but what's interesting about ossicones is that uh, in females, their skulls will continue to ossify until they're about six years old. And so females will have like this little nubby ossicones on it. But males, their ossicones, their skulls will just continue to accumulate bone throughout their life. Disease. And so like the biggest, oldest bulls, if you've ever picked up like an, an old, el, uh, old uh, giraffe skull, and I don't know why many of you would, but <laughs> I have. I picked up quite a few, and let me tell you, they are extraordinarily heavy, uh, and they just continue to accumulate bone. They look like someone's just like dripping wax, uh, but instead of wax, it's bone. And, and males will will develop these uh, these median ossicones. So they'll have like a horn popping out of their forehead, and they've got even Rothschild's giraffe are called the five-horned giraffe because they are a, 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 um, even more pronounced in their bone development. They've got what these called these nuchal protuberances. Uh, and, and so the idea behind this next for sex hypothesis to get about it in a long way is that the biggest, baddest, oldest males have the heaviest heads and the thickest necks, which make them uh, the most potent warriors for these sexual battles. So some of you guys may have seen it if you've seen giraffe uh, in the field. Males have like this, this really intense social uh, hierarchy. Uh, and usually younger males can identify when they're sort of lower on the pecking order. They know I'm not going to try to fight the big guys. But the big guys, when they get at it, uh, they'll sort of lean against each other. And to fight, they'll actually whack, just line up next to each other, lean on each other, and just swing their heads like these big old maces. And so the heaviest skull and the longest neck has the most torque and is the most potent. And the idea there is that uh, the males who are most capable of winning those fights uh, will able to be able to pass those. Yeah, Jean's on. Males will accumulate muscle and mass on the neck, too, throughout their life. Uh, they, they'll reach a, they, they sort of cap out at like 19 feet. Like the tallest giraffe ever on record is like 20 or 21 feet, something like that. So you don't get much higher than that. There's sort of biological constraints on that. But males will continue to accumulate bone on their skull and like mass in the neck. So like the biggest, oldest moles, ma males are typically uh, the dominant ones in that hierarchy. Yeah. <laughs> could, could be, could be, although I'd like to see people fight like giraffe fight. <laughs> I don't think it would work the same way. Um, yeah? Potentially. Ooh, you did your homework, yeah. Uh, so that's actually, uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but I love it. Um, so, wait, can I, can I wait to get at that one? Yeah, no, that's a very important distinction, and it's got some serious conservation ramifications, how we're actually classifying giraffe. Um, so we talked a little bit about the necks uh, and the necks for reproduction. So let's focus a little bit on reproduction. Giraffe are very fascinating in how they reproduce. Uh, unlike a lot of other animals um, in these seasonal environments that have regular reproductive seasons, giraffe are aseasonal, asynchronous reproducers. So they can breed any time throughout the year, and there's no one peak in when they're reproducing or giving birth, which is pretty incredible in these savanna ecosystems, which have like a pretty marked dry system uh, or dry season, and then some wet seasons. So resources do vary over time, but giraffe are still able to reproduce throughout the year, and indeed we see it in the population I study as well. Um, they have a gestation period of roughly 14 months. Um, after which they give birth to a six-foot baby, just welcome to the world with like a six-foot plop. And it's up and walking in an hour. I've seen it happen. It's unbelievable uh, to watch this animal go from this gelatinous mass on the ground to a six-foot animal walking around within an hour. It's truly remarkable. Um, but another really cool thing about giraffe reproduction is that after that female's given birth, 
she can cycle again, go back into estrus within a month if conditions are right. Uh, and they can conceive, gestate while lactating simultaneously, which is very unique among a lot of animals in these systems. So if the nutrition's right, if the environmental conditions are right, they can just keep pumping out giraffes. Uh, um, through, yeah, which, which is really remarkable. So if conditions are good, giraffe reproduction can be really, really high, which is something special for an animal as big as giraffes with a gestation as long as giraffes have. Does that also have an advantage insofar as if you've got wildebeest, they all more or less have their young at the same time, which means the lions have a field day. Well, that's, that's also a good strategy for the wildebeest in that, in that the young quickly outgrow the period in which they're easy prey. Yeah. So you just swamp the predators with a bunch of young and say, there's a thousand babies, but I can only eat three babies in a day. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden the babies grow up and they're much harder to catch. Um, so that, that, that in and of itself, the wildebeest is sort of this, this. Well, I was just thinking that it might be easier because the giraffe doesn't have a specific time the lions come looking. That's also, a yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's also a potential explanation for that, depending on predator densities, yeah. Um, so the social structure of giraffe then, if they have this reproduction like this, they have to have a social structure that sort of fits in uh, with the system. Uh, and giraffe kind of have this loosey-goosey social structure, and we call it fission fusion, in which it's kind of like a cocktail party, the analogy is, where they're sort of wandering around a room, and there's a punch bowl over here, so there's going to be a lot of giraffe over there. Uh, but sometimes they'll mix and mingle with this group that's hanging out over there. Um, and for females in particular, it's largely, largely driven by resource distribution. Uh, but like perhaps maybe in cocktail parties, I haven't been to too many cocktail parties. Uh, for the males, it's largely driven by females. Um, because females are cycling aseasonally and it's difficult to pr uh, predict when and where they will be receptive, males are just like wandering around all the time looking for females that are sexually receptive. And they'll do this, it's incredible to watch if you're with a group of giraffe, they'll just walk up to the next group and then uh, they do this thing where they'll induce urination in the female, they'll stick uh, their nose right by the muzzle and she'll, she'll start urinating. And a lot of mammals that do this, they have this response they call flaming. Well, they'll, they'll like purse the lips back and they'll draw the urine across this organ on the top of their mouth. It's called the vomeral nasal organ. It's a specialized sensory organ. And they can sense whether or not she's receptive based on the, the cues in her urine. And by, just by watching the giraffe, I can tell, watching the male's response, I can tell whether or not that female is sexually receptive. Because if she is, he's on her and he's not letting her go. He's, because she is a valuable resource for him. But, um, if she's not, he'll just move on to the next female. Uh, and that's the way it goes. Uh, so feeding, that's another important thing with giraffe. Um, giraffe are what we call obligate browsers. So they eat uh, pretty much leaves on trees exclusively. Uh, and in these systems, uh, these trees uh, have evolved under, under intense browsing pressure. Uh, so this is really strong selective pressure for these trees themselves to not be eaten. And so a lot of these trees have these crazy thorns. A lot of you guys have been over there seeing these acacia thorns. Uh, in addition to the thorns, they've got these crazy chemicals, these alkaloids, condensed tannins. And you guys have any red wine in here? No, well, if you do, you, you'll, you'll taste that stringent flavor, that, those tannins, which make it dry. Those tannins are a secondary uh, compound in a lot of plants, uh, which actually bind to proteins in the plant you're eating and make it less nutritious. So it's, it's a chemical defense uh, in these systems. And it's something that giraffe have to contend with in a lot of the things they eat. Um, so given the size of giraffe, what they eat, uh, um, what they need in terms of, of, of resources, you might imagine that there's only a few places that they can actually live. But indeed, giraffe are rather cosmopolitan across sub-Saharan Africa. If you go there now, there's 21 different countries where you can find giraffe. And, and, and they, they vary in, in terms of the habitats in them quite remarkably. You've got these incredibly like mesic environments, these, these wet savannas in like Uganda and Democratic Republic of Congo and Tanzania. And then you've got these semi-arid scrublands in northern Kenya or like the Nigerian Sahel. And then you've got these incredibly hyper-arid deserts in like Namibia, where if you go there, it looks like a Martian landscape. But somehow giraffe persist. Uh, they're incredible animals and they can live in a wide range of habitats, which is something that's incredibly remarkable. Uh, but given this incredible cosmopolitan range, 
uh, giraffe are in trouble uh, in terms of their conservation status. So over the last 30 years, we've seen a decline across the continent of Africa of roughly 30 to 40 percent, uh, such that now there's anywhere between 100 and 110,000 wild giraffes left on the planet. Uh, back in December 7, 2016, I believe, uh, the IUCN Giraffe and Okapi Specialist Group, of which uh, I and my advisor are both members, uh, we published a report uh, for the first time ever uh, changing the conservation strata status of giraffe from least concern to vulnerable. Just to give you an idea of how many giraffe, 110,000 is, is sort of this abstract number. There's roughly three times more elephants in Africa than there are giraffe at this moment. And everyone's concerned about elephants, rightfully so. Um, but giraffe also perhaps maybe need a bit more of our attention. It's what we call a, a silent extinction. Um, and compounding this is that taxonomic concern. How many giraffe species are there? Right now, the IUCN classifies giraffe as one species with nine subspecies. So we've got, let's see if I can do this right. West African giraffe, Cordofan giraffe, Nubian giraffe, Rothschild's giraffe, reticulated giraffe, Maasai giraffe, thorn across giraffe, South African giraffe, and Golan giraffe. Is that nine? I wasn't keeping track. Yeah. So nine subspecies, right? But some of my colleagues at an NGO I work with, they sampled genetically across almost all the populations in Africa and found that genetically these nine subspecies actually cluster rather strongly into four distinct species. I don't know. Where did you, where did you see that? Where did you read that? That's great. I'm excited that news is getting out there. Yeah, well, giraffes are cool, I don't blame them. Um, so there may actually be, uh, indeed, four separate species of giraffes. Uh, and if we're worried about the conservation status of one species of giraffe, if you split that one species up into four separate species, we've got a lot to be concerned about uh, if we want to protect these unique and iconic species. Um, so that's largely what I do through my research. And I focus uh, on Uganda. What's interesting about giraffe across the continent, though, some populations are doing really well in some areas. Southern Africa, for instance, South Africa and Namibia, the populations are, have been increasing. Other populations, like the Democratic Republic of Congo or Central African Republic or, or Northern Kenya, the populations are declining. And so threats and conservation status vary across the continent. Anyone who's been to Africa knows it's an incredibly diverse place, uh, biologically, ethnically, politically. Every, it's, it's, just, it's, a, it's a huge continent with, with, uh, with lots of complicated facets and giraffe live across the whole extent of it. So trying to understand giraffe and the conservation context is, is rather complicated. So I work exclusively in Uganda, and I'm working largely on a Ugandan population of giraffes, trying to understand how this population changes over time, looking at this cog of the giraffe and the cogs around it, trying to understand how it interacts with this system. And Uganda has a fascinating narrative uh, for giraffe ecology. Uh, which we'll talk about uh, now. Um, we started this project uh, in July of 2014. So my advisor over at Dartmouth, uh, Doug Bolger, who some of you may know, um, had met up. He'd been doing work on giraffe in Tanzania for a while. And through that research, he had met up with um, this conservation NGO called the Giraffe Conservation Foundation, who's been doing work in giraffe conservation across the continent. And together they identified this gap in knowledge. Um, up until this point, no one had been doing these sort of long-term studies on giraffe in Uganda. And so nobody really knew what was going on. There were some government reports that had uh, um, um, given out aerial surveys and rough abundance estimates. So people had kind of an idea of how many giraffe were in Uganda. But there weren't any confirmed counts. Uh, and we didn't have a very good understanding of, of the population dynamics there. And so. Uh, to address those gaps in knowledge, uh, they teamed up to, to fund uh, this PhD position of which I sort of stumbled into after I'd been studying zebras in Kenya for the four years prior to that. And I was looking for something new to apply my, my skill sets to and, and move on. And, and this wonderful opportunity to build a research program in Uganda really, really struck me. And so we went out and, uh, and we went to Uganda in July of 2014. And we we, uh, we met with some of the Ugandan officials there, and we asked them, like, what is it that we need to know about giraffe? Uh, what are the things that are missing? And question number one, how many giraffe are out there? And so that was our first question, uh, trying to identify where giraffe were, 
uh, contemporary uh, abundance and population dynamics, and then we wanted to put it into sort of this historical context. Uh, so we went out, we looked at the park where the giraffe were. At the time, in July 2014, giraffe were only found in two national parks in Uganda. Murchison Falls National Park, which you guys have been to, and Kidepo Valley National Park. Have you been there? It's one of the most beautiful places on earth. It's stunning. Um, so we went out there just to check out the system. Uh, and then we came back and we sort of reassessed. And uh, one of the things we did was we hit the books hard. Uh, and we looked at all the literature available on giraffe in Uganda. So that meant going to museums, that meant going to government offices in Uganda, dusting off the old reports that no one had looked at since the 1920s. Uh, um, indeed, the uh, paper were crumbling in your hand as you were paging through it. Uh, looking at these old reports of, of giraffe abundance and distribution estimates. Uh, reading reports from like British colonials from like the 1880s and mapping out every location of every place they saw a giraffe. And so we have, ultimately, I think we had uh, 75 different sources um, of reports of where giraffe had been seen in Uganda for the last 150 years. And then we went out and we looked at where giraffe are now. And, uh, and we were trying to estimate abundance and population dynamic trends there. Um, and this was actually a rather complicated issue uh, in that some of the historical uh, methods for estimating abundance and population dynamics are these aerial surveys, right? So they fly over this landscape and they just count the giraffe from above. But these historically have been, uh, they've underestimated giraffe and they don't really get at some of the nuance. So we want to know how the population's changing over time. We want to know what the demographic rates are, survival, uh, uh, reproduction, how that varies over space and time, whether or not survival is different with males, females, uh, if females are giving birth in certain areas of the park, what are the key resources? So to get at those issues, we developed uh, this individually based uh, photographic survey. So giraffe are really helpful in that regard in that every giraffe has a unique spot pattern. It's like they're carrying a name tag. It's as unique as a human thumbprint. So I can look at a giraffe, uh, we, we take digital photographs of them, and then we can compare it to a database of previously cited giraffe and develop this encounter history for every unique giraffe in every population of Uganda. And so we can estimate survival. We can see if we've got geographic coordinates for every location, so we can see where they've been. We can see the habitat uh, uh, that they were a part of. We, we do vegetation surveys as well, so we can see what types of plants they're, they're interacting with. Uh, and over time, so we did these surveys. Every four months, I was flying back to Uganda, uh, and we were doing these surveys where we were driving through this whole park. Murchison Falls National Park is Uganda's largest national park. Um, it's bisected by the Victoria Nile, and giraffe are only on the north side. But the north side still is an area of 1,600 square kilometers. So we would survey that 1,600 square kilometers twice every four months, since July of 2014 until uh, December of 2018. And over these successive uh, uh, survey events, we started to piece together this individual history of like 1,400 different giraffe, where they were, who they were with, uh, um, uh, whether or not we, we saw them in certain seasons, whether or not they switched locations in certain seasons. And from that, we can start to piece together uh, survival, reproduction, uh, space use, social dynamics, of this incredible population. And so we did that in Murchison Falls National Park. And then we went up to Kadepo Valley National Park. And we did it up there as well, although the population is much, much smaller. And so we took that information back, and we started to analyze it. And we found some really cool trends. Um, and we placed them in historical context based on what we saw from our literature search. So let's look at it holistically from this incredible narrative of the giraffe in Uganda. Put our, put our imagination and, 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 and hop in our imaginary time machine and go back to the 1890s, which is our first record of giraffe in Uganda. Uh, now, people who live in Uganda have been seeing giraffe forever because they live with them, but unfortunately, there's not uh, a great documentation of that. So a lot of our records were based on, on you know, from colonial periods on. Uh, unfortunately. So we've got records of giraffe back in the 1890s across the whole country, north and south of the Nile. 
uh, all across. Um, in 1890, in the Amin Pasha Relief Expedition on the, the, uh, the, the, the shorelines of, of Lake Edward in the southwest, we saw a giraffe. Um, but then an epidemic of rinderpest came up and wiped out all giraffes south of the Nile. But even still, we saw a giraffe historically all across northern, central, eastern giraffe in Uganda. Um, giraffe were so abundant indeed that the Ugandan Game Department in like the 1920s and the 1930s had instituted giraffe culls. So where giraffe interfered with uh, cotton crop, which was a pretty uh, a prolific um, um, cash crop in Uganda at the time, giraffe would actually eat the fresh cotton. And uh, the Ugandan Game Department went out and, and killed giraffe. So we have records of those giraffe that we killed. And we saw that indeed giraffe were widespread. Um, but as agricultural development expanded, um, giraffe need trees. They don't need much, but they do need trees. And trees and farmland often don't mix. Uh, so they became more constricted into these protected areas. So by the 1950s and 1960s, we maybe had seven distinct populations of giraffe spread across uh, central and northeastern Uganda. Um, but the, Uganda, the, the populations were still holding strong. But then the 1970s come along, and you guys have been to Uganda. What happened to Uganda in the 1970s? Yeah. Right. Um, and so Uganda, as a nation, went through a period of three decades or so of intense civil unrest, first with the rise of Idi Amin and then Milton Nabote, and then, uh, or Milton Nabote, then Idi Amin, and then Milton Nabote came back. And then there were uh, the Bush Wars. And then uh, some of you guys may have heard of this guy, Joseph Kony, and the Lord's Resistance Army in northern Uganda. His headquarters were based in Murchison Falls National Park, which had, uh, at the time, uh, one, of the, one of the larger populations of giraffe. So during this period, giraffe go from five populations down to two. You will only find them in Murchison Falls National Park and Kidepo Valley National Park. So Kidepo Valley National Park once had 400. By the early 1990s, it's down to three. Three individual giraffe left in this park that was once one of Uganda's largest populations. Murchison Falls National Park goes from about 275 to 78. So by the early 1990s, there's fewer than 100 giraffe left in Uganda, in the whole country. But what happens in the mid-1990s? It sort of stabilizes, right? This political unrest sort of uh, levels out. And, and the human tragedy and the ecological tragedy brought about by this period of civil unrest, people start to rebound. And, and Uganda, for those of you who have been there, it's an incredible country. It's filled with this, uh, resilient people and resilient ecosystems. And this, this resilience is, is no better illustrated than, than, uh, than the story of the people and the story of, of the giraffe, remarkably, because we see this incredible growth back in the Murchison Falls population, which was at 73 individuals. 78 individuals. Uh, between then and now, the population has grown at essentially what is the maximum biological rate for giraffe. Like if you were to draw out a model uh, on an Excel spreadsheet saying wh what is the maximum possible population growth rate for a giraffe, you could fit that curve to what we've observed in Murchison Falls from 1995 until now. Lots of boneheads around. Lots of boneheads around, <laughs> yeah. But again, Kadepo, which was down to three individuals, uh, it was a bit more dire there. So actually, uh, they flew in three giraffe from Kenya. They put them in a C-130, these poor little giraffe. <laughs> and they let them go. Uh, one of the giraffe immediately got eaten by a lion. Uh, but from those five giraffe, uh, they've since grown. So that by our surveys, in our last survey in 2016, there were 36 giraffe. To go back to Murchison Falls, again, Starting from 78 to now, our population estimates are somewhere close to 1,400 individual giraffe. Such that, yeah? Is there any evidence of inbreeding? Because you're starting such a, with, with three individuals and then expanding? Yeah, well, that's a big concern, right? Why, yeah. Uh, so we've actually genetically sampled almost every single individual in the Kadepo Valley National Park population. and. Um, the inbreeding coefficients that we would expect to be really, really low, because you're coming essentially from three individuals, were not as bad as we thought they would be. Um, there are some, some, some goofy giraffe. There's a report of one giraffe that doesn't have a mandible right now running around there, which could be an effective inbreeding depression. But 
we're not necessarily picking that up as much as we would expect. Obviously, it's a concern though. Uh, and with, well, hopefully with like the influx of the Kenyan blood that kind of diversified the gene pool a little bit. And we've worked a little bit on that since. I'll talk about, about some of our other efforts to supplement these populations. But yeah, that is a, a big concern. How could it be anything other than interbreeding to start off with two animals? I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's not having any genetic defects, but it has to be inbred. Oh, they're incredibly inbred, but we're not, yeah, yeah. Uh, but again, we brought, they brought in, uh, um, yeah, they brought in some Kenyan giraffe. And so you get three and then two, and then we've also brought in some from Murchison Falls subsequently. So they're, they're, they, they have to be incredibly inbred, but the rates of inbreeding depression and, and inbreeding coefficients that we would expect for a population that small is uh, not as bad as we would expect. Yep. How confident are you in those numbers? Do you think you're underestimating the population? I, I have, so the, one of the benefits of the methods that we're using, these uh, mark recapture, is we can estimate confidence intervals about, around our estimate. And I'm getting like 25 on either side. Mm -hmm. So I am, I am fairly confident. When we survey, we're not finding any more adults. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm reasonably confident that I have a photographic database of almost every giraffe in Uganda, with the exception of those that have been born since April, uh, which is the only country in Africa that we have that sort of record for. Um, so we have, I think, of, of all the countries in Africa, I think we have perhaps the best understanding of giraffe population dynamics in Uganda. Uh, and, and yeah, and, and so that's been a, the crux of, of a lot of the work we've been doing. Um, so one, one of the remarkable things about that population growth uh, is Merchant Falls now contains more giraffe than it's ever contained in recorded history by almost an order of magnitude. So if you'll recall what I said back in the 1960s, when before the periods of civil unrest, there were like 278 giraffe in that park. And then that's sort of where it was hovering as far back as we can tell. Uh, now it's at 1,400, 1,500 individuals. Mm -hmm. So what happened in between the 1960s and the early 1990s that could have affected that population growth? Everything came in from the outside? Or everything <coughs> inside was also killed. Uh, so Murchison Falls National Park, it, coalesced in one spot. it had one of the <coughs> highest elephant densities of of any place in East Africa. So back in the 1960s, it had roughly 13,000 to 15,000 elephants. That's a lot of elephants. That's a lot of elephants. Such that the Uganda Wildlife Authority, or the game department at the time, had instituted elephant culls where they would kill thousands of elephants each year. Uh, but what they couldn't do in their managed culls, uh, the periods of civil unrest did with like a ruthless efficiency. So elephant populations declined to roughly less than 500. 15,000 less to, five, to less than 500. And they were kept that low for a period of about three decades. And so there's been some really good studies, interestingly enough, on the vegetation dynamics in that park at the same time. And so where there was once grassland in savanna, or, or grassland has, has regrown into these woodlands. So once the poaching pressure is taken off in the mid-1990s, it is ideal giraffe habitat. There are no other browsers in that park either. There's nothing to compete with giraffe. And so the conditions are really amenable. And that's one of the reasons we suspect uh, that the population has grown as it has. We're, we're looking at land cover. So we're looking at satellite imagery from the 1960s until present to quantify that change. But it's really, it's a pretty uh, strong signature. So we've got this incredible growth in this Merchant Falls population. It's really big. Uh, but it now contains 90%, over 90% of all the giraffe in Uganda. And interestingly enough, Murchison Falls National Park also sits atop one of the largest oil reserves in East Africa. Yeah, so that sort of complicates the narrative a little bit. Um, they've actually started to drill for oil in the park itself. They're under, they've, they've gone through the development phase, and now they're going to go into the production phase. Uh, so, so goes the Murchison Falls population, so goes Rothschild's giraffe, or Nubian giraffe, or northern giraffe, depending on which taxonomic uh, a classification you ascribe to. So one of the things that's evolved from the research that I've done are partnerships with the Giraffe Conservation Foundation, our partnerships with the Ugandan Wildlife Authority, is to sort of spread the conservation risk. We know that this population of Murchison Falls is growing. We know that we can take individuals out of it and it will continue to grow based on our population projections. Uh, so what they've been doing is been taking select individuals from this population, repopulating some of the other parks 
where we know there were giraffe historically, uh, but they were wiped out by periods of civil unrest. And so, from the time that I've been there in 2014, where there were once two populations of giraffe, now there's four populations of giraffe in that park. So they've taken 15 from Merchant Falls National Park and taken them down to Lake Mburu National Park in the southwest. And of those 15, they've since given birth to another uh, 7 to 10, depending on the reports you've listened to. Um, we've taken about 40 giraffe across the river to the south side of Merchant Falls National Park. And they are also reproducing. And to supplement the Kidepo Valley National Park population, in which there were roughly 36 individuals, they took 14 in August of last year and let them go. Uh, and in our most recent surveys, which I just got the results from about two weeks ago, uh, they had given birth to two, and the Kidepo population had given birth to two. So we had 36 plus 14 plus 12 plus 2. Um, so the population in Kidepo Valley National Park is also growing appreciably. And then there's plans also to take them to some of the other national parks and protected areas where they once were back in the 1950s through the 1970s, but have since been extirpated uh, to sort of spread that risk. Yep. Are there any in Queen Elizabeth? There are none in Queen Elizabeth. Um, and I'm very curious about that because the records I have for Queen Elizabeth. Yeah, I, I think memory is quite possible. I'm wrong. I misunderstood your question. Yeah, because uh, according to my records, they should have gone extinct there yeah, prior to the 1950s. The, the Queen Elizabeth also had periods of defaunation too. They got whacked pretty hard. Um, and so a lot of the wildlife there experienced similar trends to Murchison Falls. So if there were there, they would have gone out. Yeah. There's none there now, though. I can tell you that for certainty. Um, yeah. Um, so that's roughly how we, we incorporate some of our understandings of population dynamics. That's but a small component of our research. Uh, we're also doing uh, telemetry work. So we've we pioneered this use of these GPS trackers. So we'll catch giraffe, and we've got these acetone mounted solar charged GPS trackers. Uh, and we can follow them around the landscape. Uh, it's incredible. I have my, my lap right here. If we have Wi-Fi, I can actually show you over a beer after this where you know, 30 different giraffe are in Uganda from our laptop here in Norwich, Vermont. Uh, and so we can track these individuals over space and use satellite imagery uh, and our understanding of these landscapes to figure out what aspects of the habitat uh, are most important. And then we, we actually report that back to the Uganda Wildlife Authority and the oil companies doing the development to say these are critical habitat features uh, and that should not be disruptive. Uh, and we're also looking at foraging decisions. So I spoke about how some of the, the plants that giraffe eat got these chemical nasties and they got these thorns and they vary in like their nutritional quality over time as well. So in this complicated nutritional landscape, how do giraffes make decisions on what to eat? Uh, you can imagine, like, if you had nothing but, you know, Rice Krispies every morning, you get pretty tired of that. And we see the same thing with giraffe. They're not eating the same thing all the time. They diversify their diet, and we think it's largely based on these phytochemical pro properties, these chemical nasties, these toxins that are in the plants, but also the nutrients within them. So trying to understand how giraffe make these foraging decisions in this landscape where plants vary in quality and quantity over space and time and what that means for their movement across the landscapes. Again, so we can uh, identify key habitat features. Yeah? A question about that. That is, do trees communicate? I read somewhere that the giraffes come to a certain tree and the tree sends out messages to other trees saying, wait a minute, this giraffe's coming on the way. So they send out poisons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well that, 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 no, that's not, that's not an outlandish concept. So we do know that some, some plants have mechanisms uh, for communicating. The giraffe one, uh, it's a bit hand-wavy, although they're, they're, the, the narrative is that, yeah, some of these, these trees that giraffe forage upon, uh, when, when they know they're being eaten, they emit these, these aerosols that can, that can be sensed by other trees, which can then ramp up production of secondary metabolites, these chemical nasties. So there's like these immediate, what we call inducible defenses. So plants oftentimes can sense when they're being eaten and can respond accordingly. Sometimes it's very immediate, like this response can happen within minutes or hours. Sometimes it's a bit more prolonged. So some better substantiated studies are on acacia trees that giraffe consume, where over time, uh, plants will allocate less to photosynthetic material and more to defenses. So like if a, a giraffe is heavily eating like an acacia drapanolobium tree, uh, over time you can actually see 
the plants which were once leafy, dedicating less to the leafiness. And so they'll, they'll become less leafy and much, much, much more thorny. Uh, and so there's some areas in the park in Murchison Falls, for instance, where I can tell giraffe have been historically and where they have not based on the, the leaf to thorn ratio of Acacia trypanolobium. Um, so it's pretty remarkable. It's, again, it's just an incredible ecosystem and just trying to, to piece together this very limited understanding of these few cogs in the system uh, to try to conserve these relationships uh, which will have a cascading effect across the whole system. Mm -hmm. How long do the young stay with their mother and are there family clans that have groups or are they solitary? Are the males involved? In the males are typically not involved. They do their thing and then they go. Uh, but um, I mentioned how giraffe have this fission fusion society. The, the strongest bonds that you see are between mother and calf by far. And mothers with calves born at roughly the same time will sort of congregate. So you'll see like these herds of females. Um, and the calves will stay with the mother. They'll wean maybe nine months to a year. Uh, and by that point, they're, they're really, really tall. Uh, what's interesting, in these, in these calf herds, uh, giraffe will exhibit something we call aloe nursing. So you, there'll be female giraffes that will nurse calves that aren't their own. And so sometimes you'll see a, a female giraffe nursing like two or three different calves um, based in these nursery herds. And, and do the calves then, once they're weaned, do they stay in that group or are they forced out? There, it, there's evidence to suggest that calves that are raised together also have uh, stronger social bonds, but we really we don't know too much to be quite honest. This, these, these are relatively new studies, and we haven't we don't have the years of data required to address those types of things. But early efforts at it saying yeah, calves that are raised together may actually have stronger social bonds than those that were not. Mm -hmm. What are the defenses against predators? Speed. Ah. Yeah. Giraffe have incredible feet. They can kick incredibly hard in all sorts of directions. So they can kick with their front feet, with their back feet. Um, and if you've seen, I mean, there's lots of wildlife documentaries. You can just YouTube giraffe kicking lion, and uh, <laughs> off he goes. Yeah, it just catapults them. Um, it, they have terribly uh, effective and devastating feet, and uh, they are very formidable prey species. They don't run, they stick no, they'll they'll run, they'll run. Um, but uh, mother calves, actually, uh, a friend of mine was just over in uh, Kenya, and she just sent a video out. A, a colleague. Um, of a video she took of a mother giraffe defending a calf against lions. And so when they can't run, um, they'll, they'll stand on the ground and they will, they will kick. Um, and and it, is, it is formidable prey oftentimes, at least in the systems I work at, lions won't bother with them too much. Yep. So it sounds like Uganda itself is doing quite a bit of conservation you're, there's a number of organizations working with the government. Is that true? Yes, Uganda, I, I, at the moment, in the last 25 years or so, is a, is a very incredible narrative for giraffe. I'm cautiously optimistic, just given uh, where they are now uh, in terms of the development for, for oil products. If, um, but yeah, it, it, it's a good story. Uganda is also interesting in that, unlike some other places in Africa, it's, it's got one of the highest uh, human density populations. So the only places you're going to find giraffe are in national parks. You're not finding them outside. There's no, so in Murchison Falls National Park, if you drive outside of the border, you see Massey Ferguson, you see John Deere, you see New Holland. It's really intense mechanized farming, really intense subsistence farming. Yeah. So they are stuck in those national parks. Um, other places, there's some other incredible conservation initiatives. We've got some colleagues working in northern Kenya, which are more of these pastoralist communities, these cattle keepers. Uh, and so you have wildlife and humans living essentially on the same landscape. Uh, and so that has some other conservation approaches which are also very inspiring and very encouraging. Um, but I'm optimistic for Uganda, even with the protected areas that it has, um, giraffe can have a future there. There's no poaching <coughs> issues in North East, uh, Northwest Uganda? Not to the extent that there were, uh, historically. Um, there were quite a few, and, and I mean, it's on the border with South Sudan, and so there's some security issues there as well. <laughs> Interestingly, um, on, the, on the South Sudan side of the border uh, is a, a, a wildlife reserve, at least on paper, and we've collared some giraffe up there, and just in the last two weeks, we've seen giraffe cross the border into South Sudan. They turn around really quickly, 
but they do go over there. Um, and uh, since I've been studying giraffe there in 2015, they have not lost one that we know of to poaching, uh, which is encouraging. The Increase in numbers, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, been, it's been incredible. The rangers up there are, oh, the rangers we work with all across Uganda are heroic. And uh, all the credit for, for the giraffe populations goes, goes largely to them and their efforts. Uh, it's, it's really inspiring to work with such a dedicated group of men and women in, in the Uganda Wildlife Authority over there. Um, it, it really is. Um, and I can come here and I can talk to you about this. Um, but a lot of the credit goes, goes to them. Um, Yep. So what, what were the main Sorry. factors that led to their drastic demise, decline, and, and what are the main sources of bringing the population back, the main actions you took? So initially, uh, a lot of it had to deal with um, intense agriculture, expansion of agriculture. So you had these, these populations which once were widespread, human, uh, human density goes up, uh, colonial development develops these areas for, for cash crops like cotton. Uh, subsistence farming, so places that were once these savanna ecosystems are now intense agriculture. So the population is restricted now into these protected areas. Um, after that, there's these periods of civil unrest, and um, we've got we've got documented records in in Kadepo of South Sudanese soldiers coming over during periods of civil unrest. Um, and, and after post Idi Amin, there's records of Ugandan soldiers retreating through some of the national parks uh, and essentially using them as 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 food. Um, right, because it's, it's, a, it's a huge animal, uh, one bullet, and you can get a lot of food. Uh, we see that happening in northern Kenya, in Democratic Republic of Congo, and CAR, as sort of a, a war fodder. Um, so illegal hunting is one of the issues, something we see even today with some of the, the snaring. Um, so some of the efforts we have to conserve them now, given those historic threats, the threat of poaching has decreased on its own, just given to political stability. Um, which is very encouraging. Again, Uganda is uh, an incredibly safe place, even, even in spite of some of the headlines you may have seen recently. Um, I've never felt unsafe working there, and I would recommend going to Uganda to anyone. It's a beautiful country, beautiful wildlife, beautiful people. Um, but uh, the habitat as well. We've seen uh, uh, woody vegetation increase in certain areas, and that's largely an artifact, this ecological legacy of these periods of civil unrest, uh, but it's worked in the giraffe's favor. Um, so that's, uh, that's something that's encouraging. And um, so there's places now um, where there historically were giraffe and there historically were large populations of elephants uh, that have been extirpated. And so the goal now is to continue to use the Murchison Falls giraffe population as a source population to reestablish uh, these satellite populations in other places in Uganda where historically they have been. Uh, historically they were extirpated, but the threats have since subsided and the conditions are still amenable to giraffe population growth uh, based on some, some you know, post-translocation uh, surveys. I, I would endorse what you're saying, Michael. So, Uganda is a wonderful country. People are very friendly. And the Ebola stuff you read about Ebola, it's across the border. It's nowhere near where mm -hmm. you're going to go anyway. It's not an issue. The incident of somebody being kidnapped yesterday for fundraising is being a local little inside job. It's not an issue. Uganda is a wonderful country, one of the best birding anywhere. Yeah. Many, many endemics and near endemics, and at the end you have the gorilla furnace at the end. I mean, it's, it's incredible. I would recommend it to anyone. It's a, it's a beautiful place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I might have missed it, but how long do giraffes live, approximately? And um, what, what are the poachers after when they kill the giraffe? What part of the giraffe do they want? So giraffe can live. Um, it's tough to say, but um, in the wild, we suspect they can live. 25 to 30 years if they make it past uh, sub-adult. So the, the most dangerous time to be a giraffe is when you're a baby because you're, you're still sort of wobbly legged and you make a pretty tasty morsel for a lion. Once you get past that stage, um, at least in Uganda, um, giraffe uh, adult survival rates are really, really high. And so they can get to 25, 30 years old, we, we suspect. One of the giraffe that they translocated from Kenya um, and that airplane, I got pictures of, the, of, of her from the person that they moved them from, and I compare them to the, our database, this, our photographic database. These are all the giraffe in Kadepo Valley <coughs> National Park. I compare them to this photo. Uh, it was, her name's, I think, Mary. Um, and I found her. She's like, she's like 23 years later, and she had given birth that year. So we know that they can at least be there till 23 years old giving birth in Uganda. 
What are they after in, in poaching? Um, it's really tough to say. I've actually never talked to a giraffe poacher. Um, but uh, the narrative is that uh, bushmeat is largely part of it, um, food. Um, historically, there's records of certain tribes prizing um, tail hairs for, for um, bracelets and stuff. Um, uh, the Karamajong especially have had a reputation for that. There, there's a really fun anecdote from some of the reports I read where um, conservation initiatives were strongly enforced. Apparently some of the, uh, the Karamajong uh, warriors would actually snip the tails of sleeping giraffe with, with scissors. <laughs> And uh, yeah, because uh, those tails were so prized, the tail hair. Um, have you had your hand up for a while? Sorry. You answered Did I? Okay. Question. Yeah. I don't know quite how to ask this, but um, in the question of genetic uh, diversity, with all the bringing in the other from Kenya and so forth, do you have any idea of how much of this, these four? Subspecies are surviving, or is, is it all changed? The well, genetic makeup? well, but that's that's an important uh, management plan. So the types of giraffe that they're moving within Uganda mm -hmm. are all essentially the same flavor of giraffe. Um, they're all, again, depending on which taxonomic classification you ascribe to, they're all either Rothschilds or Nubian or Northern, but they're all like genetically like the least common denominator. So that is a concern, right? That's something that that conservationists certainly take into consideration. You don't want to be uh, washing out uh, uh, certain gene pools. Even with the Kidepo, Murchison Falls uh, um, population, the concern there was a concern that Kidepo Valley National Park and the giraffe there was a unique genetic reservoir for that particular area. And then by introducing genes from Murchison Falls National Park, you're essentially swamping those out. Uh, but ultimately, the managers decide that the risk of local extinction was just too high. Uh, that that was uh, a risk they were willing to take. Yes, sir? Um, has the uh, elephant population rebounded in Uganda? Yes, but not to the extent that the giraffe population has. Uh, it's, it's gotten better, um, uh, but it's not nearly as high as it was. And there's evidence to suggest that the 15,000 back in the 1950s was actually an artifact of prior management. It's, we don't have records predating that, um, but the reason that people suspect that there were so many elephant in that area uh, was that was, uh, even before it was a national park, it was designated a sleeping sickness prevention area. So the colonial government had actually forced, uh, evacuated people from that area uh, to prevent the spread of trypanosoma, sleeping sickness, spread by the tsetse flies there. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so because there were fewer people there, the elephants just sort of came in. Uh, and as people, the population densities grew up around it, they came in and may have artificially increased the density there. But even, even today, uh, we, we don't see numbers nearly as high. I think the, the, low, the most recent estimates are somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 for elephants in Murchison Falls. Mm -hmm. I was thinking with giraffes, you see in Acacia, but it sounds like they eat a lot of different plants. Are there um, any other herbivores that you would expect to see a decline in it compared to the population? No, that's what's really cool about Murchison Falls National Park is that aside from elephants, giraffe are the only browsers there. Unlike other parks that have kudu, that have impala, that have dictic, -dic, that have elan, all things that eat leaves on trees, uh, there's none of them in Murchison Falls National Park. So we'll actually see giraffes, no joke, eating trees that are like four inches tall. They'll like push their way through the grass to eat leaves off of trees that otherwise like would be gobbled up by a much, much smaller browser. Um, so that's another factor potentially contributing to this eruptive population growth is that there's very limited interspecific competition. All the competition for browse is essentially within giraffes, which is, which is pretty cool. There's, there's not very many places where you see uh, that type of population structure, that type of community dynamic at play. Are um, those other browsers not ever there, or have they just been wiped out? Difficult to say, but we don't have any records of Impala being there. We don't have any records of Kudu or Elan being there in Murchison Falls. Um, it's, a, it's a weird place. Like, there's no zebra there either. Which any of you have been to East Africa, to not see zebra in a savanna system, it feels empty, but there's no record of zebra ever being there. Which is, uh, th there's some, some goofy dynamics at play there that I haven't quite figured out in that system. Yeah, this is a lot of trees for a savanna. It is, it is uh, but it wasn't always that way. So I, have, I just got some satellite imagery from 1965. Oh, wow. And like, if you've gone to like the Delta area of Murchison Falls National Park, 
there's grassland in the 60s, and now there's these beautiful groves of, of Crateva, Adansini, Harrisonia, Abyssinica. To get to your point, they're not just eating acacia. We've got, we, we do these protocols where we, I will follow a single female giraffe from sunrise to sunset, and I will identify every bite of every species that, I have a little clicker. I've, I've counted over 750,000 bites of, no, no joke, of giraffe. So I know exactly what they're eating because I've counted it, uh, and, and, and largely they're eating, there's, there's 12 dominant species, and there's lots of other, you know, you know 20 some that they're mostly eating, but it's, it's largely 12 dominant species, and I can name them for if you want later. Yeah? I bet, I bet we can get Michael to stick around for a few more questions. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. In fact, Michael accepts contributions to his research in cash and liquid form. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thank you, Michael. Guys, thank you. Thank you very much.